the idea is to fundamentally take compounds through clinical proof of concept. Uh, that's phase two, and I'm going to get into what that means in subsequent slides, but that's typically an important point where you actually can say, yeah, this drug actually works in humans and it has a, a beneficial effect in a robust manner. We know that this is, uh, this is going to work. Um, so that's fundamentally where we're, what the company is about. It's an interesting company. Uh, yeah, the, the folks that started it are not the usual players in the space. And there's a lot of folks, I guess, uh, like me and others, that, that have been in the space for a very long time. This one was different. It was actually a bunch of young um, private equity, equity guys, et cetera, other uh, uh, executives in other areas that have all been sort of uniquely impacted by depression in particular. And they came together, they weren't able to get, uh, you know, standard therapies were not working for them. They ended up using things like ketamine, uh, at that time not approved, as well as psilocybin, and having this profound impact, having this profound benefit from these compounds and endeavor to make sure that these things can get out there. I mean, this is a, this is a story you've heard a number of times from different groups. Um, these guys took uh, a particular approach to it that, uh, that certainly appealed to me. So why depression? I mean, I kind of gave you the, the bit of the outline there, but there are three companies that are listed that I'm listing at the moment. Compass, you may or may not have heard about. They're developing psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. We have another company called Perception. I'm going to talk a little bit about ketamine and uh, S-ketamine. Um, you know, again, we have the two, two sides of a given molecule. So ketamine is both, and then S-ketamine is one of those. We're actually looking at R-ketamine. It might, the, the hypothesis there is that you may be able to dissociate uh, the psychedelic effects from efficacy. So that's something that we're very interested in. And then there's a compound that's not particularly psychedelic, um, but is also focused on depression. Um, so, you know, a uh, quick question here. How many people here either had depression or have know somebody that had depression? Yeah, exactly, right? So it's incredibly impactful. I mean, that's really why we're in this space, right? This is, this is the problem. We have therapies, again, some of which I'll outline, uh, but still there's this massive unmet medical need. There's just too, so many people that are really suffering. And one of those people is someone that I work with and I have been working with for about a year now. Young guy, 25 or so. Um, really smart, but has the misfortune of, being, of suffering from crushing depression and aspects of obsessive compulsive disorders uh, that really kind of racked his life for a very long time. He's incredibly articulate, and I, you know, some of his descriptions uh, of the suffering and the therapy and everything else are just phenomenal to me. Uh, you know, so that first paragraph about uh, you know, the depressive episode, the mental phenomena, the edge, the extra weight. I mean, that's why I use the word crushing. It's this inability to get moving on things. It's uh, you know, the activation energy, if you will, to, to just to, to get something started. The lack of excitement, that's a really key component to depression, right? You, you're just, things that normally give you pleasure don't really anymore. So there's just a lack of motivation to do anything. Uh, this la the second paragraph, I think, is really critical, too. It's this internal narrative, right? This internal critic telling you basically how much you suck, right? I mean, that's kind of what it gets down to. Um, and I think there was a sentence here that, uh, that really that caught me. I, I try as you might to escape and find comfort. There's nowhere to go. You're caught between an increasingly hostile external world and a merciless narrator. Desperation can set in quickly. Again, that's just really powerful to me, and I think it does a great job of uh, summing this up and sum, summing up this summary of, I mean, the uh, experience of this. So let's talk a little, I mean, so, you know, most people think of depression as depressed mood, and of course, that's part of it, right? And, but there's, there are some, there's a formal definition, if you will, uh, for depression, which is used in clinical studies and used in epidemiologic studies, and that's obviously very important. Um, so, you know, in the, in the case of my, uh, my colleague, you notice that he did talk about mood, but it was almost like the mood was secondary, or the depressed mood was secondary. He was really, you know, in the, the first paragraph, he was talking about di diminished interest, right, and uh, lack of pleasure and activity, something that we refer to as anhedonia. Um, and that seemed to be driving some of this. And then, you know, some of this other stuff, slowing of thought, to reduce activity, this loss of energy, uh, feelings of worthlessness, I think that's broader. It's really rumination, right? So there are these negative thoughts and you just can't, you can't make them stop, right? That they are taking over your life. 
Um, and difficulty thinking, et cetera. And of course, suicidal ideation. Um, that's a major driver of suicide, though not the only driver. Uh, depression is not the only driver of suicide, as it turns out. So to, to meet the criteria for depression, the formal criteria, if you will, you need to have four of these, greater than four of these, so five or more. Um, but they have to include one or two. So that's pretty critical. So using this kind of, uh, that kind of a definition for depression, you get these sort of epi epidemiological results. And I have to admit, I'm floored every time I look at this slide or every time I read these numbers, right? I mean, it, you know, you don't really grasp the enormity of the problem until you see these, uh, these kinds of numbers, right? It's 300 million people in the world suffering from depression. I mean, that's the population of the US, for example. Uh, you know, about 60, 70% of the population of the entire EU. It's an enormous number of people. It is the leading cause of disability, not a leading cause, but the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, prevalence, 10% of adults in the United States had a major depressive episode. Again, formally defined episode in the last 12 months, and 20% um, experienced it in their lifetime. I think that next bullet point is actually one of the most chilling, right? Uh, the number of people living with depression has, has really gone up. And to me, what's even more disconcerting is that it's young individuals, right? So it's adolescents and you know, through their uh, 20s, essentially, and particularly, uh, particularly girls and, and uh, women. So I think that's uh, you know it's a very disconcerting phenomenon. I'm not really sure what to make of that, why it's happening. There's certainly speculation around the fact that maybe social media contributes to it, but I don't know if there's any causal data that, uh, that actually exists there. And again, that last bullet point, 800,000 people dying due to suicide, right? I mean, that's crazy. And suicide is the second leading cause of death um, among young folks. So, you know, really uh, just incredible numbers, incredible impact of this, uh, of this disorder. So how do you manage it? Well, I think you guys are probably fairly familiar with a lot of this. I mean, therapy is really critical. There's life, the things that kind of fall into the bucket of lifestyle changes. And those are increasing social interactions. And that doesn't mean social media. That is not the same thing, but actually going out there and talking to human beings. Um, relaxation or really getting rid of stressors in your life or trying to, to, to the degree possible. Getting enough sleep, eating properly, all these things are good. Exercise is a great one. Was there a question? Yeah, you're talking to someone that's been meditating for 10 years. I totally agree with that. Yeah, um, I think it's it's really important. It's it's a fantastic way of gaining insight into what's happening and and some of those feelings. So I totally agree with you on that. Um, so exercise is another thing that is really critical, quite frankly. I, you know, in terms of looking at lesions in the brain, so to speak, due to depression the loss of cells in the hippocampus, the thinning of that area, we know that exercise is at least as good as any um, sort of standard or conventional antidepressant. So very important to do that, even if it's difficult. And, I, and that's clearly the problem here, right? That A motivation uh, to actually get out there and do, excuse me, do stuff, including being social and exercising, et cetera. So it's, it is really a challenge. And then, of course, there's medication, which we're going to be talking about today. So we know there's lots of conventional antidepressant medications. I mean, fundamentally, the pharmacology of this class of drugs really hasn't changed since you know, at least 50 years. Um, and it was kind of a fortuitous, uh, it was kind of an accident how that was actually discovered, this original uh, class of medications, which the very first one was uh, an anti-malarial, believe it or not. There were people taking this anti-malarial, and the doctors noticed that uh, their mood seemed to improve. So that's how this all got started. But basically, there have been different versions of that that have gone, that have been marketed and brought to market and developed in the subsequent years. And you know, the, the issues are that there's relatively limited efficacy, and there's reasons for that. I mean, it, they may not work in a subset of patients, and that's fine. Of course, they do work well in another subset. Uh, compliance is, is poor. So people don't really take them as well as they should, and that's probably because they're not seeing a benefit immediately. And there's side effects, you know, sexual side effects, uh, sleep disturbances. Um, weight gain, and given the population that we're talking about, these are all things that are really critical and impact the quality of life, not surprisingly. Um, even when things go well in terms of, you know, so you, you, you're being compliant, you're taking your medications, you're taking them every day 
when you do real therapeutic trials, a couple of months worth of therapy, you end up with only about a third of people um, getting good, you know, basically remitting from their symptoms. Um, even after a few of those trials, you know, you, you kind of stack them on. The first one fails, you move to the second one, you add it, you go with a different class a little bit, you tack something on, you do more psychotherapy. Even after that, even after that, um, you end up with a, you know, a, a basically a third of people that do well, another third that have residual symptoms. So there's still, you know, there's still morbidity there. They're still suffering, but their symptoms are a little bit better. And then there's another group that haven't moved at all, right? And that's really disconcerting. And these folks have lots of issues, as you might imagine. It's like 30% have suicidal uh, attempts, I believe. It's, it's a really tough group, right? So um, this is an important bunch that, that there's been a lot of attempts to address. I mean, you're adding on antipsychotics, for example. Um, but really, things haven't moved. I mean, there was other therapies, I guess. You know, there's electroconvulsive therapy, you know. Uh, um, but that, 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 has its, uh, <laughs> that has its issues, I guess. People aren't particularly uh, crazy about that. Um, and then there's things like medical devices that are implanted. Again, these are much more, uh, you know, invasive kind of therapies. So not, not great options, basically. So this is where the rapid ant acting antidepressants really are a game changer, right? So I guess these broadly fall into the psychedelic category. Ketamine was the first. It's funny that actually one of my, my PhD uh, committee members um, was John Crystal, and he's one of the, uh, the originators of this whole concept and you know, was a big fan even all, the, all those years ago. And it's just great to see this really come to fruition over time. Uh, so ketamine works really well. It works rapidly for many people. Uh, they get a just incredible um, lift in their mood within four hours. It tends to persist, you know, on the order of a week or so. So we talked about the uh, two hands here. The Spravato is the S ketamine. It's the S enantiomer of ketamine, ketamine that recently got approved. I'll be talking about that as sort of a case example or case uh, study um, in the subsequent slides. And then, of course, there's uh, psilocybin, right? So some really interesting results that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna talk about. So the, the nice thing here is that they seem to work in many folks with treatment-resistant depression, right? And they don't have the chronic side effects because they're intermittent, they're sort of acute intermittent therapies, uh, maybe not particularly intermittent in the context of uh, uh, psilocybin-related compounds, but you know, we'll have to see. Um, you don't really have these long-term effects, and I, I think that's a huge uh, point of differentiation. Though at the moment, it's not clear whether or not you have to have other medications in between. So is it like a cancer therapy? Do you induce with psilocybin and then maintain either with low-dose psilocybin or some other compound? I don't know that that's fully been worked out at this point. I'm not gonna get into this. Uh, this is, these are some of the early, you know, the trials that have been done. These are nice, I mean, they're small studies, let's be clear. They are double blind, which is, and, and controlled studies, that is really the standard, uh, for better or worse, in clinical trial design. You, you need to have something that uh, um, accounts for the bias there, that, uh, that can happen, particularly in mood disorder trials. I mean, just the laying on of hands, so to speak. Being in a clinical study, seeing the doctor, seeing the, uh, um, the, the rest of the staff on a regular basis does tend to help. Maybe it ties into that whole social interaction bit. I don't really know, but it does tend to help. So you do need some kind of a control. You need some kind of a, either placebo or an active, and, and several of these do have that. Um, I think the interesting part is the duration of efficacy, and I think that's the part that really differentiates this compound. Right? We've got efficacy out six months, a year after taking these compounds, and that speaks to something really profound happening in the brain. Um, whether that is the neuroplasticity angle, right, and there's, uh, you know, changes in, in the wiring, and uh, we saw some data around that, how the brain is all hooked up differently, and maybe it's a bit of a reset. So don't know exactly, but clearly something uh, profound is happening. That's also something that we gotta keep in mind, right? So if you're taking this in a loss of control setting, you can then have deleterious effects. Well, sure, right? We know there's plenty of reports out there of folks that are taking this and maybe not the ideal circumstance, you know, psilocybin or something else and having pretty adverse, um, having a very adverse impact that lasts a long time. So just, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So that colleague of mine actually has taken psilocybin, or, you know, therapeutically and also had uh, ketamine therapy and fundamentally not 
context of psilocybin and ketamine assisted therapy. And what he talks about again is really interesting. You know, this disassembly, this assembly, this uh, ego dissolution is something that is profound and um, particularly for you know, this broader focus is something that really comes up many times when you talk to these folks, these, uh, these patients. This, uh, I was talking, oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, I saw ketamine and psilocybin showed health in general mood disorders. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that or if you could comment on that. Um, <coughs> trials that I know of have excluded bipolar. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, actually. Uh, with psilocybin, I just talked about trying that. There's been reticence to put any of these compounds into a, into a condition where there can be mania, um, and that mania can actually include hallucinations. So, yeah, again, these are. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it may, right? They, they were referred to as psychotomimetics, they were used as uh, a human model of schizophrenia. I think the interesting bit, though, is that schizophrenia in particular is associated with a lot of neuronal loss. Right? So these have, you know, psilocybin has a profound effect on neurogenesis and, you know, in the, in the hippocampus, but it also has an effect on kind of uh, improving connectivity. So could it have an effect? I mean, could it be a really bad trick, but then have a beneficial effect that lasts longer? I, I don't know. I think, I, to me, that, that, to the best of my knowledge, that really is a study. Um, so, yeah, uh, just touching quickly on this, the second paragraph was really interesting here. So, it's this ability to step back, right? The ability to give you the distance that you need from all the negative thinking, all of the, the stuff that's bothering you. Again, that's something that's come up. I was talking to a, one of the big researchers in the space, a guy named David Feifel, who's at uh, San Diego. Um, and he was even relating to me a woman that had recently been raped. She was able to step back with ketamine therapy and say that in the grand scheme of things, how this kind of fit into that. I'm like, okay, that's that's just amazing to me that a drug can give you that kind of perspective. Again, as I mentioned earlier, as someone that's been a meditator for a long time, that second paragraph really resonated with me. It's taken like 10 years to get there, right? So this drug, a single administration of this drug, appears to have, you know, given that person that this colleague went that bad. So really amazing. He has an interesting comment, as you can see at the bottom there, about ketamine and differences between ketamine and psilocybin. Ketamine alleviates the sheer weight of depression, and uh, psilocybin adjusts how you can create. Which, wow, that's a really interesting thing. It's a different perspective on it. Um, and I think he has actually benefited, I believe, with ketamine in terms of repeat therapy. Um, in terms of psilocybin, it's been much less frequent uh, every year or so. But he's doing great, so that's, that's really good to see. Okay, so let's kind of transition to, you know, that's the promise, right? That's, the, that's why many of us are here, you know, we want to get this out there. We want to get it to those folks that are suffering, right? So how do we do that within the medical model, right? So what does that actually even mean? What does it mean to bring a, uh, a drug to a patient, a medication patient? Well, I, you know, fundamentally, okay, so please, yes. I want to explore this from a business perspective. So we see significant impacts from a single dose, but you know, from the perspective of um, the revenue model, it pays more to have a customer become a lifetime yeah, customer. Yeah. So how do we keep these incentives aligned between the more of psychedelics and the world of commerce that sort of wants the uh, like wants wants for the profits? Yeah, do you mind if I touch on that a little bit later? Because I want to get into some of the pharmacoeconomics of it. And if I haven't answered your question, please jump back in. I believe there was somebody else. Okay. Yeah, just to try to clear. I was wondering, when you were speaking about the No, that was a pretty high dose. So this is their, yeah, the, these were quote unquote therapeutic doses. I mean, I, um, yeah, I, uh, so I, I know at least one of those was 25 milligrams. The other one was, you know, psilocybin. The other ones were, I, I don't know what the dose was, but uh, thought to be high doses. Yeah. 
Okay, so again, kind of jumping back here, what does it mean to get a drug out? So first you gotta get it approved, right? It's gotta, you know, there has to be some mechanism that you go through, that mechanism you go through, so you can get doctors to actually prescribe it. And the next piece is just as important, and many people lose sight of this, just because a drug is approved doesn't mean anybody is going to prescribe it because maybe no one will be able to afford it or pay for it or anything else, right? So you've got to make sure that um, you work with payers, whether that payer, and I'm using the term payer very broadly, whether that is a government or it's an insurance company, really doesn't matter. You've got to work with them and give them the data that they need to actually reimburse you for the therapy. Okay, so let's start with that first one. Um, what does it take to get a drug approved uh, by a regulatory authority? And the FDA is what I have the most experience with, but the reality is that all regulatory authorities uh, are basically the same. I mean, so there's, there's subtle differences, but the big picture is exactly what's here. It's all about risk benefit, okay? That's what it's about. So it's looking at the condition itself, seeing how existing therapies work in that condition, and seeing the severity of that condition. What I mean by that is, if you have uh, end-stage ovarian cancer, the risk-benefit is very different than if you have acne, right? Um, so in certain cancers, the side effect of the drug is it makes you sterile. Okay, that's a pretty bad side effect, but it might give you months, if not years of life. That's the trade-off, right? So that's how it works. Um, and if you have a new drug that only gives you the same amount of life extension but doesn't get you sterile, uh, give you sterilization, then that's huge. That's a big advancement. If it's worse than that, then of course that's not great either and there's, a, there's not a very good argument for approval then. So they're gonna take a look at the indication, they're gonna take a look at all the data you generate and then they're going, once the drug is out, you know, there are risks for every drug. Every drug has downsides. Every drug has adverse effects. Um, and so they're gonna take steps to manage that risk out in the marketplace. And there's federal mandates to actually do that in the United States and certainly Europe. So what does that really look like um, at this point? Well, it means uh, you know, adequate and well-controlled studies is, is something that's gonna keep coming up in the context of uh, uh, you know, FDA approval. And usually that's replicated data and of course showing uh, 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 safety over the course of those studies or adequate safety uh, over the course of those studies. Uh, this is a big long process. You start with basic research and you know, you, this is really focusing primarily on the compounds. Uh, so you've got to find those compounds, you've got to make sure you're comfortable with those compounds and you do preclinical development. You put them into animals. And this is important, you've got to make sure there's no toxicities in the animals, right? So you dose them, you dose them at very high doses, you see what happens to them, you do pathology on them, you look at their brains, make sure there's no damage to the neurons. You, make, you look at their hearts, you look at their lungs, you look at their kidneys, you look at all that stuff, and you keep dosing, you look, make sure there's no carcinogenicity, there's no impact on uh, fertility or offspring, et cetera. Particularly relevant for this population in, in, for depression, you know, fertility and impacts on embryogenesis is really important. So you've done all that, you've got to then get it into human beings. So first you do baby doses. You start really low and work your way up. In humans, you do it only a single time. Usually normal healthy volunteers, that's what a phase one um, study is. Then you expand to multiple um, doses in a phase one. So normal healthy volunteers still, you're looking at so-called PK, the pharmacokinetics. How does this drug look in the blood? Looking at pharmacodynamics, what is happening as a function of, that, uh, of the, those concentrations. Then you transition to phase two, once you've established all that. So phase two is when you start looking for actual efficacy. So now you're in your patient population, so in this case, depression. And you're seeing, you know, you may or may not have the statistics nailed down. You're looking at what kind of endpoints you can move. But you're trying to see if there's anything that is already there there. Is it, a, is it acceptable tolerability? These are small. When I say small, I don't mean small, small. They're like 100 to 200 patients, as we'll see. Uh, there usually are more than one of these. Um, small biotechs usually try to get away with one, and it invariably bites them in the butt. So usually a couple of these trials to get through. Then you talk to the FDA or any other regulatory body, and you say, this is my data. This is what I want to do with the drug. This is what I want my trials to look like for the so-called pivotal um, studies. These are the big ones that um, show efficacy in a, confirm, in a statistically confirmed manner that we don't need to get into. And then the agency can say yes or no. 
right? <laughs> they can basically say, yes, this profile looks and the rationale looks reasonable, we'll let you proceed with that, or they can say, no, you can't do that. Um, and then you do the phase threes. These are massive studies typically. So when I say massive, depending on the indication, depending on the class of drugs, this could be as little as 300 people. It could be as much as 1,000 people. It could be more than that. I mean, in neuropsych, it's usually no more than, I don't know, 600, 700. I guess I've seen a couple of trials that are close to 1,000 um, with phase three. So that's the whole process. Then you go through the FDA. You give them all this data. Then they make their they make their judgment. This could still, you know, this may not meet uh, safety and uh, the, the risk-benefit ratio they want to see, given all the analyses that they've done, as I've already indicated. Then you get the drug approved, and then, you, then you're in the market. Again, I told you about some of the risk mitigation st um, strategies that are there. So the question is, why the hell does it look like this, right? Why is it this complicated? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Lots of people died along the way. Lots of people got really sick along the way to get these rules to the way they are. Early 1800s in the United States, you could do whatever you wanted, right? You could get any drug you wanted, you could import it, you could do whatever you want, no problem. People died. <laughs> and so then the first, and it, it was weird, I think it was in the Mexican-American War, I was looking at this the other day, um, there were things that were being used for like cholera, I don't even know what they would be using back then, but they were using something, they were importing them, and some of this stuff was tainted, and people were dying. So the very first bit of regulation actually was focused on imports and purity, just purity of the drugs. And then, okay, so that was good for a while. And then someone stuck some sort of additive. They use a particular chemical process for uh, some kind of a drug. And um, they, once again, people died. So now they, the, uh, the, the next set of regulations said, nope, it's not, you have to be pure and you have to be safe. All right, so that was the next thing. And I think that was in the 1930s or so, 1920, 1930s. And then finally, you guys have probably all heard about the whole thalidomide crisis. It's, you know, it's something that was pretty, uh, pretty awful. Um, basically, these uh, people were taking this medication for morning sickness, uh, these women that were pregnant, obviously, and they were getting babies with very marked um, uh, body dysmorphia and, uh, and uh, birth, you know, basically birth defects. So then that's really what kicked off. You now need to be pure, you need to be safe, and you need to be effective. And you can't market um, until all those are there, and you can only market for the things that you tested. And what does that look like? I mean, so, you know, when you've got several thousand people in clinical studies, you're like, oh, that's a lot of people. That is nothing, right? If you've got, if this is a population like depression, how many millions did we just talk about, right? So if you have a side effect, a lethal side effect that occurs, you know, much less than a hundredth of a percent, that's going to kill a lot of people. It's going to hurt a lot of people. But you're not going to necessarily see it in these clinical studies. So we make them as big as we can. We do as much work as we can for long-term safety. And then we see, and that's what some of this work is. You've got to do a lot of post-marketing surveillance. If any signal shows up, for safety, you go back under you, you go under a review, a review process, and the FDA has the uh, authority to pull a drug for safety, and it has done so many times. So that's kind of the big picture here. Now let's transition to what that actually means, right? So this whole process is like 10 years, uh, usually, and that's an average. Some are longer, some are shorter. Um, and just the clinical piece and all the way to approval, it's about seven and a half years on average. And again, some are longer, some are shorter. So the, if you were just you know, doing the biotech plan, like a startup plan, like the minimal number of trials, most neuropsych type of indications, you can assume at least 100 million or so. I mean, typically maybe 150 million, but 100 million if I was really pushing it. And everything aligns. You have no screw-ups along the way. You might be able to pull it off with $100 million. That next bullet is really critical here. So the likelihood of approval from a phase one drug, so you've been in that very early stage, you've shown that there's PK, there's PD, it looks broadly okay. The chance of approval in psychiatry is 6.2%, okay? The, phase, the chance of approval from a good phase two is 11%. So think about that. We've got tens of millions of dollars on the line. And what is, you know, your, and that money is tied up for years, right? It's not the whole hundred million because you can kind of uh, dole out the money along the way, but it's, it's, 
you know, a phase three trial, 20, 30, up to $40 million, you're all in. You are all in. And that money, you're not going to see any, you're not even going to know if that's worth zero um, uh, until three years. Now, once the drug is, you know, you, you got a, uh, you've got a successful trial, awesome, great. Then you go through the FDA review process, they say no, right? You, that money's gone, all right? So you get through the FDA, and you're on the market but it doesn't take off for one reason or another. You can't get payer reimburse, uh, reimbursement. That money is worth zero. And it could have taken five, six, seven, eight years for you to figure that out. With those kind of probabilities, I'm just talking about approval, not even market success. So, you know, you presumably all have money in a bank, right? You're getting, I don't know, it's not much percentage interest these days, but you're getting some percentage interest. There's no risk. Some of you are like, eh, I want more return. I want a little bit more return. I'm willing to take some risk. And then you put it in the stock market. You put it in an index fund or something. And you know, you're still not, you know, the downside risk is not huge, right? I mean, even a massive uh, recession might take the market down, the total market, uh, maybe 15, 20% typically, right? Yeah, one hopes. <laughs> one hopes it's not worse than that. Um, so what kind of return would you like to see for those kind of percentages? I'm going to give you money, but, or you're going to give me money. What kind of numbers do you want to see? I know when this isn't 100, but this isn't five bucks, 10 bucks. I want you to give me, you know, I don't know, 50% of your savings. What percentage of return do you want to see there? That's the question you got to answer for yourself. And that's the challenge here for drug development. And that's why we have the model that we do, right? So we have VCs like, uh, like where I work, or we have other mechanisms of funding is for a large pharma. They have the deep pockets to be able to pull this up. That's the issue here. That's the problem of why it is, there's so much money in it and that's why drugs cost as much as they do. It's not the drug, that's nothing in many situations. To make the drug is nothing. It's this, it's getting to this and making sure that you get a return on this. Again, real world, I mean, we all wanna live in something that is utopic where we don't have to worry about this. Real world. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about Spravato, which I think is a really interesting case study, particularly from the, you know, the, the psychedelic and mood disorder perspective. This is, again, S-ketamine. Just got approved in the United States, um, I guess in March. And it's for treatment-resistant depression. So, fantastic. One of the first new approvals of anything significantly different. Again, and I have no, I have no idea how many years. Everything else has been pretty, you know, normal antidepressant medications. So this is really pretty amazing. Um, a lot of excitement about it, um, a lot of complaining about cost, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides. So the path to approval, this is what it looked like. <laughs> 30 trials, 30, actually I think 31 trials, okay? What I may have, you know, I talked about the number of subjects, number of patients in each one of these trials. Phase three is where the money is, right? That's what, you, that's how much, that's where the, the big heavy lifting is. For a biotech, probably 20 to $30 million for those trials. For a large pharma, probably more. Their internal costs are a lot higher. So maybe pushing $50 million. So, you know, if I had to estimate at the floor, it'd be around $300 million for this development program, at the floor. And then, of course, there's preclinical and stuff that may have added another $5 million to this. It's a rounding error at this point. We don't really care. So that's kind of the reality of it. That's what it takes. That's just to get to approval, okay? So let's talk about psilocybin now. Where are we with psilocybin? Because again, I think there's a ton of promise there. Um, we are here. That was supposed to be a mushroom. I guess it sort of doesn't look like one. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, I don't know what the hell that looks like. Anyway, so we're kind of early in this whole process. There's uh, phase one that's wrapped up by Compass. There are two phase twos that are in process. Again, Compass is a company that is within the Atai um, umbrella. USONA is not. So uh, this is public data. This is clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, the website there says that for Compass, they have a roughly, I know it's impossible to read that. It's a 215 patient study, um, you know, double blind placebo, uh, not placebo control, but active controlled. And it started in January. They're hoping to wrap up around the middle of next year. USONA has a smaller study. I think, what is it, 80, 90 patients? Um, they're hoping to kick off later this year. So September, I'm not sure that uh, it, it has actually started, to the best of my knowledge. So that's where we are. And you know, how this work plays out from here is going to depend on the results. 
So things look amazing in early stage studies. In open label studies, things look phenomenal. They absolutely look amazing. By the time you grind through phase two, they don't look as great. And by the time you get through phase three, yeah, it's not nearly as awesome as you thought it was. And that's just the reality of it. You know, it's more standardized. There's more people doing it. They're not the experts, right? These aren't people. You know, this is the real world. You want to get it out to people, that's how you do it, right? It, your levels of efficacy always drop. And the duration of efficacy is going to drop. And, and ketamine is a good example. No one ever said it was going to be you know, permanent. But um, certainly some very early reports suggested you can have efficacy up to four weeks. And then it became two weeks. And then it became one week. And then as Spravato's label is twice a week for the first four weeks, then once a week after that, and then as needed. OK? So to answer your question, um, I guess it depends, right? So this is where it's going to, we're going to have to get the data for this. Um, I tend to agree it's really challenging to uh, make it to monetize uh, if you have a single therapy. I mean, obviously great for the patients, obviously, but for the people that paid all that money, they want all that money. And so, you know, this, and the payers in the United States have really struggled with this, right? So there's, a, there's something called hepatitis C. I'll, just give me a sec. Um, hepatitis C that used to be a chronic condition, but we have drugs that can cure it. But those drugs are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of back and forth on how to handle that. The other complexity to an insurer, and you know, uh, no one's going to like, uh, the insurance company's not going to like me talking about it, but the reality is that patients in the United States tend to roll through insur insurance companies every couple of years. So is there an incentive for an insurance company to pay, let's call it half a million dollars for a therapy, and then the patient rolls off? Yeah, it sucks. But again, real world, right? It sucks. I get it. But that is how it works. Uh, and if you're running the books on that, I can promise you, you'd be thinking that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I, OK. So yes, up there, and then I'll. How much does that provide cost? I'm going to get to that. You know, that's a really great question. I, so again, open label, there's a bias. The placebo effect's in your, in your favor, et cetera. Um, when you get to larger studies, you know, the medication is the medication. There's going to be more loosey-goosiness with the patients that come in. They're more standardized now. So there, if you have a practitioner that is, or, you know, like let's talk about psilocybin. There are people that are dosing this. They may have a lot of experience with this sort of patients, and it may not be verbalized, but they may just intuitively know what kind of patients are going to do well with this, or maybe not, right? So if they know that, that may be a bias towards, you know, that's a bias. It's a good bias, but towards those people that it'll benefit. So, so by, by the time you get to the phase three of the diagnosis, you should be if not, nor, they will change usually, um, but not drastically from at least in industry trials. They may drastically change from some academic trials. So we tend to go more towards standard criteria because we're always thinking ahead to the, an approval and what the FDA is going to want to see. No, for phase one, it's normal healthies. Typically. Okay, so phase two. Yeah. Treatment resistant depression. Let's talk about compass and psilocybin. Yeah. Phase three will also be treatment resistant depression. So the criteria for inclusion does not change. In this context, they won't. Right. So my question is where does the reduced efficacy come from by the time yeah. we run a thousand people in phase three? Again, the inclusion criteria didn't change. The include the reality of the patients coming in changed, right? So there's a lot, of, again, it's a, a whole esoteric, uh, there's a lot of esoteric here. But the bottom line is that there's, a, there's incentives or, you know, there's perverse incentives for the site to pull patients in. So, and again, I'm not saying it's done intentionally. It's just that that's how it is, right? There's biases there. And there, you know, people that may not be ideal come in for different reasons. And of course, there's other stuff. I mean, 
the, the, pe the people that end up in later stage studies may be you know, either more tightly defined or they may be more loosely defined depending on the trial um, because you want a positive result. So you don't want variability, right? So you, you go really tight on some of those trials and then you want some real world experience, right? So what happens if someone's also on an SSRI? What does that look like, you know? What if someone weaned off an atypical antipsychotic? What does that look like? So there are different factors that come in. Once you get out in the real world, things sort of look better because now your placebo effect is back on your side. So things look a little bit better. But the variability persists. Now you've got a standardized protocol. I want to get to that in the context of esketamine. You've got a standardized protocol for the therapy and you're rolling it out. It's cookie cutter to some degree now. You're trying to roll it out to a lot of different clinics. There's going to be variability in that. So we're getting to the break time now. Which oh, is fine, I'm sorry. But the next, the next presentation will start in um, 10 minutes. So we can. I can okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're, we're into the break time now, which is fine. We can continue this until uh, we have another 10 minutes till the next presentation begins. Let me try and get. Yeah. Let me try and get going on that. So just quickly, what is, so we talked about cost. I mean, uh, risk benefit, now we're going to talk about cost benefit. That's really what the payers want to see. Um, you need the data to generate, you need to generate that data all the way through, and that's what adds additional trials, it adds complexity through the development process. You have to show a benefit to existing therapies, over existing therapies. Why should I pay for this is fundamentally the question. So, different question than the regulatory folks. So, let's talk about Spravato. Um, I mentioned that they had gotten approved. So what does their approval look like? There are some factors that really impact availability. One of those is that you have to do this, you have to dose this in a supervised setting. Usually that's a clinic at this point. It could be a healthcare provider that's coming to the house, I suppose, but usually it's in a clinic. Um, they don't have to do much. They have to, they have to dose you and then they have to watch you for a little while. That's pretty much it, so a couple of hours of watching you. Um, but that has to be done. And how does the agency enforce this? Well, they've got something called a REM, REMS, uh, you know, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. And this is enforceable, right? So they make sure that you only get the drug and the, the patients are signed up into the REMS, the doctors are signed up into the REMS, they have, tr they have uh, um, basically coursework, and the pharmacies are in the REMS as well. So everything lines up, and if there's problems, the agency can figure this out pretty quickly. So this is all kind of complicated, right? Um, and how do, you, how do you make it a, a success? Well, J&J &J knows what they're doing, right? They've got resources. And so they can do pre-market activities. They do the trial stuff in advance, but just marketing a drug, launching a drug can be a $30, $50 million endeavor by itself. So they actually established Spravato uh, Treatment Center. So the, the staff is adequately trained there, presumably. Um, they establish a drug supply chain. Again, not something that's necessarily trivial, um, but it has to go all the way to the REM certified pharmacies. They got the robust quality of life data that I alluded to. They've done payer negotiations. They want to make sure that when, when this drug is out there, patients don't have to pay a ton to, uh, to, uh, to get the drug. And these are what go into drug pricing. This is all the stuff that goes into drug pricing. It's not the price of the chemical, right? So let's talk a little bit about the costs. So the wholesale drug costs, and this is where J&J uh, &J got a lot of pushback. It's around six to $900. I mentioned, you know, it's just one hand of ketamine, right? Um, so ketamine is dirt cheap. It's like 25 bucks. So the patient costs, however, and that's actually what drives things. In the United States, the patient costs around 10 bucks if, if you're insured. And this is about, I mean, it's gonna be about two thirds of people in the United States. It should be around 10 bucks for them. If you want to get IV or IM ketamine at a ketamine clinic, it's, I think it's around 500, it may be more than that, or it may be a little bit less than that, but it's about 500 bucks, and that is out of pocket. The agents, no payer is gonna pay for that. It is not an approved therapy. So drug administration, I'm talking about this two hours, you gotta hang out. Um, that's actually paid by your visit copay, right? So the insurance companies are okay paying for your, you know, going to a doctor. So that's gonna be covered by that. So total patient costs are actually not that much. They're solidly less than $100. I mean, it just depends on how much it costs for you to go to the doctor, go see the doctor. It might be as little as 10 bucks or free. It could be as much as 50 bucks. I, I don't really know. It'll just depend on your insurance program. So total patient costs are less than 100 bucks versus 500 minimum just for ketamine. Out of pocket, okay? For most people, I'm not saying this is for everyone, for the majority of people in the United States, 
I'm going to just do one and then just try and wrap up. Go for it, yeah. Okay. But I just like to say one more thing is that, you know, you're saying real world, um, this sort of capitalist approach, but when we assume that that's the only possibility, we close ourselves off to creating a real world. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that, but I totally agree with that. I mean, so what I'm doing is not necessarily advocating. I'm giving you what it takes to get it within this model, right? Are there other models? Potentially, but... With, if you're trying to go through and make a medication and get it approved and get it on the market, this is basically what it takes at this point. Are there other things you could do, perhaps, right? We've I'm, seen that with maps, right? Like a nonprofit can do it, it is possible. It is possible, and, that, and again, as long as all of these other factors are brought, in to, are brought to bear, that you can get it out there, you can cover the cost of these additional trials because you, you, you're more uh, capital conscious um, than something that's VC backed, for example. If you can get all these other things out there and do the pre-market activities, I think it could work well. Or you work with the, um, the military in that context, right? Because the military has its own um, structure. So there's, there are different models, to be sure, um, that could work. All right, I wanna wrap this up. I mean, uh, yeah, I think this is my last slide anyway. I mean, the clinic, uh, it's a couple of caveats here. Clinic visits are more complicated for psilocybin. It's not, just dose it, it's psilocybin-assisted therapy, and that's definitely what Compass and USONA are really targeting. So just a much more complex thing. So you gotta deal with that somehow. What kind of clinic network is that gonna entail? And you might have to come up with new reimbursement codes or strategies. Uh, it might be differentially scheduled, so that's gonna be complicated. So uh, ketamine is just C3 in the United States, full stop, and so is S ketamine. Psilocybin may end up being schedule one and three or something. So it, it might get a little bit complicated there. And then you're, you're gonna get a REMS. It's gonna be a complicated REMS. And you're gonna have to implement it, you're gonna get approval on it, and then you're gonna have to administer it. So again, just some complexities that need to be, uh, that need to be considered. These are mostly, I mean, clearly a lot of this is US focus, and it, it, there are gonna be differences between territories, but you get the idea. That's kind of what I wanna convey here. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Again, cost, risk, and benefit. Apologize for running over. I'm gonna blame you guys for the questions. All right. <laughs> Thanks.